This is a quick uh, response to something I saw in text today in conversations. Um, and no amount of typing can usually do justice to such things. So I'm going to do a video response. Um, may or may not make this public, I don't know yet. Anyway, this is an analysis of a critique of the literal historical grammatical hermeneutic that I use. I have a link here, I've, I've posted it other places. Um, it seems, as far as I can tell, to, been, to have been a response to the meaning and context of Acts 9, uh, 1, 9 to 11, where it says, uh, you know, Jesus' ascension, he says, it says, having said this, he was lifted up before their eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. As they stared intently at the sky, suddenly two men in white clothing appeared beside them and they said, you Galileans there, why are you just standing here gazing into the sky? This very same Jesus, who was lifted up from you into heaven, will return the very same way you watched him go. Now, the, the debating has been, in, these are informal uh, debates, not technically debates, but arguing. Um, <clears throat> see, I, I couldn't get an answer to this as to why this should not be taken literally, physically, because the disciples watched Jesus with their physical eyes literally watched him raise up from the ground, literally watched until a cloud hid him from their sight, and then literally there were two angels there, it's obvious who these are, who said, stop staring at this guy, he'll come back the way you watched him go. The way they watched him go was literal and physical. They saw him with their physical eyes. Therefore, by the angel's statement, he must return in a visible way, not a spiritual way, not a metaphorical way, but a literal physical way, being seen with physical eyes. No amount of other context in the Bible can change this. This is historical record in the book of Acts. This is not anyone's moral teaching in this passage. It's talking about what Jesus said at, to his disciples and then he stepped away from them and was raised up into the sky. This was not a vision. It was not a trance, as the word was used for when Peter saw the sheet full of unclean animals drop from the sky three times. It clearly says in that passage it was a trance. This is not a vision, a trance, or a dream. This is historical record. That's the genre of the book of Acts. So what can possibly anyone argue against Jesus' return, his parousia, is the word here, what can anyone say against that being exactly what the angels said? He'll come back the way you saw him leave. Nothing. No other context can override this because it's historical record. It's not a moral teaching. It's not a parable. It's not a vision or a dream or a trance. So the arguments will be made anyway. So this uh, document is going to go into usage in the Bible of the coming of the Lord which this return will be. It will be the coming of the Lord. But does that mean we can take the same language in another context and import it here is the, is the question. So this person goes on to say a series of posts which examine prior parousias, meaning presence or coming, usually of an official nature, in the Old Testament where the Lord came to earth in judgment. Which again, when Jesus returns, he will be, there will be judgments in the tribulation before he actually comes. When he actually touches the earth, certain other things will happen. And so they're trying to make an argument that this context doesn't matter. That we have to interpret it in light of other comings of the Lord in the, New Te or the Old Testament, the prophetic ones, even though... The angel said plainly, you'll see him return the way he, you saw him leave. Okay, that's the argument they're going to make. So, they can be described, this person goes on as, as an appearance of God, but also the manifestation of his divine glory. That is to say, the presence of God can be seen 
in a glorious form, not just, and, and here again, is this just someone's imagining or dream or vision, or do they literally see some glorious thing? That's the question we have to keep asking. Now they go into Ma uh, Micah chapter 1, where it describes when God came against Samaria in judgment. That's their tie-in, the judgment, for covenantal disobedience. This occurred in B.C. 722 or 21. The instrument of the judgment was the Assyrian army, so God brought the Assyrians against them. And we all agree, contextual historical facts. These two were literal physical things. They were not visions. Okay, but metaphorical language can be used. And here they quote Micah 1, 1 to 6, the word of the Lord came to Micah in these certain days, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning, it's a judgment of Samaria and Jerusalem. And it says, hear all peoples, all of you listen, O earth. Okay, that's obviously, the earth doesn't have ears. This is poetic language here, a different genre than acts. Let the Lord God be a witness against you from his holy temple. The Lord is coming from his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. The mountains will melt under him. The valleys will split like wax before the fire, etc., etc. All this is for the rebellion of Jacob and sins of the house of Israel. Uh, what's the rebellion of Jacob? Is, is it not Samaria? What's the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? So the, even in this poetic language, it's identifying the rebellion of Jacob as Samaria, and the high place of Judah as Jerusalem. So this is a prophecy of judgment against Samaria and Jerusalem. Now cities also cannot sin. They cannot rebel. But I think this is the Greek term is synecdote, where a word refers as a part as if it refers to the whole. And so that's what we have going on here. Even though this is Hebrew, it's a linguistic thing. It's just saying what the Greek word is, because I know that one. I don't know the Hebrew word. And so we have a synecdote here that Samaria and Jerusalem stand for the people within them who are sinning, who have rebelled. So this, again, does not impact the historical record description of an event that everyone saw with their physical eyes in Acts 1. And then it says, I will make Samaria a heap of ruins, planting places for a vineyard. I will pour her stones down in the valley and I will lay bare her foundations. So he's going to ruin Samaria with descriptive language. Now the question comes, they say in verse 3, did God literally come to earth from his place in the heavens, take on a physical form? Did he literally walk or stomp on the high places on the earth? This is poetry. Yes, it's prophecy. What's the reality behind the poetic language of the prophecy? That ruin will come to the people of Samaria and Jerusalem. A real thing, a physical thing will happen. Because historically, that this person appealed to, these places were ruined by the Assyrians. So it points to a real event that would come. However you describe the event, it's like the same saying we have, if it quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, it's probably a duck, no matter what you call it. In the same way, we use figurative language to describe the fact, in that instance, that someone is claiming not to be something, when in fact, by every indication, they are something that, that thing. In the same way, real physical ruin is going to come to some, the people of Samaria and the people of Jerusalem. No matter how it's worded, it's about a real thing. God's judgment is not simply spiritual. There will be physical consequences coming to these people for their rebellion. Okay? So using this language is no different than saying if it quacks like a duck and walks like a duck. It must be a duck. God is going to lay waste to them for their rebellion, for their sins. So... A real, literal, physical thing will happen. They will see it with an experience and, and suffer it, not spiritually, but physically, in spite of this language. Okay? So, of course, he didn't literally do these things that figuratively he's talking about. What he literally did was bring ruin and destruction on them. So, a literal thing happened. Yes, using this language, you could say that God stomped on them. We say that today. 
if one team wins over another team in, in a, a lopsided victory, and we say they stomped on him, or words to that effect. And we all know that we're not talking about literally stepping on people physically. But we are saying literally that we beat that team. Just in the same way, God literally physically brought ruin on the rebellious people of Samaria and, Jude, and, and Jerusalem. So it's talking about a real thing, not a vision, not a spiritual ruin. This is physical ruin that came to them. The same with verse 4 and the melting mountains uh, and all these things. This is hyperbolic language. Hyperbole is a feature, not a bug, of Hebrew poetry. Just like Psalm, uh, so Psalm 150? No, that's way off. Uh, I forget which Psalm it is where the Calvinists like to use it to say, uh, where David says, in, mother, in sin did my mother conceive me. He was using hyperbole. He was very much convicted over his sin against Bathsheba and murder of her husband to try to cover it up. So, even though David spoke that way and sin did my mother conceive me, the Calvinist error in saying that that is literal. It's poetry. And the literal historical grammatical hermeneutic recognizes genre as it does in Acts 1, consistent with the hermeneutic, that the genre is historical record and the people saw something with their physical eyes and they were told they would see that same kind of event happen with their physical eyes. So, and this person goes on to say, although serious destruction did happen in Samaria, was it to the level of this highly apocalyptic? Mm, this, this is not about the end of the world here. This is about a judgment that's already happened in Israel's past. This is not the end of the world. It is a coming of the Lord. The Lord visited these people with judgment through the Assyrian army working on his behalf. And apocalyptic, the word apocalypsis in Greek, which this is a transliteration of, means to reveal. That's why in English we call it revelation. When we're taught, and people misappropriate the term apocalypse to mean end of the world judgments. Okay, it is an unveiling, an unsealing, whereas in contrast, Daniel was told to seal up the words of the vision of the prophecy. John was told not to seal it because the time was near, at hand, which again doesn't mean it happened in the first century. It's been, as far as the biblical language goes, the last days since Jesus came. So this is not apocalyptic and it's not the end of the world. And one thing we can all agree on, this never happened. We're not at the end of the world. Okay? This is not the end of the world right now. It's getting close. But this incident in Micah is not about the end of the world. You could if you wanted to say there's a dual fulfillment. But we know it happened once. It could happen again. That doesn't mean that we can only take this as some kind of spiritualized allegory of the struggle of good and evil, which is what one must do to be a preterist. So it's, he's, this uh, article says, how did God actually appear? Did he literally stomp on mountains? No, but he literally brought ruin. Yes, it was figurative. Yes, it was hyperbole describing his wrath through the uh, invading Assyrian army. But did something real happen? Yes, it did. Did they use poetic hyperbole, all sorts of other figures of speech and prophecy all the time? But is that what's going on in Acts 9? Absolutely not. You can't say that because sometimes an appearance of the Lord has to do with uh, flowering language, you know, figures of speech, the Lord will come back. That is not a spiritualized coming as it would be for anyone who got saved and the Lord comes to them, right? So what they're saying is the Lord will never really come. He's already here in us. Nobody doubts that the Lord is already here in us. 
But is that his parousia? No, it's never called that. It's, Jesus said, I'm going to go away, but I won't leave you like orphans. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit as the comforter who will guide you into all truth. And we know that the Holy Spirit indwells a person as soon as they put their trust in Jesus to reconcile them to God and accept his offer of adoption. That's a real thing. It's not just spiritual. It's real, even though it is spiritual. So, if, if all of this was to argue against this slam dunk against preterism, it doesn't work. They watched him go with their physical eyes, and the angel said, the same Jesus who was lifted up in, uh, from you into heaven will return the very same way you watched him go. The angel did not say he will return in spirit and truth or in dreams and visions. He will literally be seen with physical eyes. There is no other way to interpret this passage in its context, which is historical narrative. So, appealing to hyperbole and other figures of speech does not change what is being meant here in Acts 1, 9 to 11. It just can't. It's not applicable. It is, uh, in logical fallacy terms, a non sequitur. Because it does not follow that if a comings of the Lord in the Old Testament are use figurative language, that the Lord doesn't actually come in some physical real way. But in this case, we, I mean, we can't take those contexts and put them here. This is by we if we study all the scriptures, this passage in Acts one not one nine to eleven is at the end of the judgments, the end of the day of the Lord. A lot happens before that. And as we know from study of other passages, when especially the Apostle Paul talks about the rapture, he talks about an event that has no context whatsoever as to timing. It doesn't mention disasters. It doesn't mention the Antichrist. It doesn't mention any kind of uh, buildup or sign. And the differences are, the key differences, just again off the top of my head, are that it, at the rapture, that as Paul describes the event in several passages, Jesus comes in the manner of the wedding terminology that he used at the Last Supper. He said, I'm going to go away and prepare a place for you. And when I come again, I will receive you to myself and be with you always. That's the wedding analogy is the, after the betrothal, the groom would go away to his father's house and prepare a place for the couple. He wouldn't know when it would be approved by the father because he couldn't go and get his bride until the father approved the room that he added on. Meanwhile, the bride didn't know when anybody was coming either. She had to always be ready to go. When he did get the approval, he would gather up his friends, usually in the middle of the night. They would carry torches, they would blow trumpets, and they would shout to give notice to the bride and her handmaids that the groom was coming. And she would quickly gather her things. He would come outside the house. He would not go in. She would come out to meet him, and he would take her back to the new room. And they would be in seclusion for seven days, and then come out and have a wedding feast. This is undeniably analogous to, and this is Jesus' own analogy, to a real thing that will happen in the future, where he comes for his bride. He doesn't come all the way to the earth. It doesn't say that. It says, uh, in Paul's passages, he says, for uh, the Lord will come with a shout, with the trumpet of God, the shout of the archangel, the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will be raised first. Then we who are alive and remain, uh, in another passage says that we will be transformed in the twinkling of an eye because the mortal has to be replaced by the immortal. Then all of us are taken up, harpazo, uh, snatched, up to meet him in the air. And so we will ever be with the Lord. This is, a, And then we will be taken for seven years. There's the seven, analogous to the seven days. 
of seclusion. And d- during that time, the wrath of God is raining down on earth. After it's over, Jesus comes back from heaven with us, not for us. He touches the earth this time. The mountain does split in two. It says half going north, half going south. And then there is the wedding feast. So to confuse that described event, and again, this is not just in one passage, to, to confuse that with the judgments that came for the past seven years before or before the, the coming up to the earth, or the rapture before that, when he comes for his bride, not with his bride, is very, very bad interpretation. So the literal historical grammatical hermeneutic does not confuse these things. It says, look, in the Old Testament in Micah, we have language that is hyperbolic, and figurative about exactly in colorful terms how God is going to bring judgment upon people in two cities. They will have physical suffering, okay? In the same way, physical things happen with Jesus' ascension that will happen at his return. And the big difference is this is historical narrative here. This is them watching with physical eyes, and they will see again with physical eyes. So the literal method does not disregard genre. It pays very close attention to every aspect of context, whereas a misappropriation of hyperbole into a a news report, basically, historical narrative, is very, very bad eisegesis which is the opposite of exegesis. It's putting things into the text instead of taking them out. Or some people call this uh, helicopter theology, where you take passages or you know sections out of their context and drop them someplace else. So the mere fact of hyperbolic language regarding a, a visitation of God does not mean you can take that and impose it over a context of a physical reporting of an event, historical narrative. You can't do that. You will learn, you will lead yourself into all kinds of error. So as I said, none of this applies to Acts 1. None of it applies to Acts 1. Okay? Yeah, you can use colorful words to describe something, but it's a real something that you're describing. And again, that passage in Micah isn't necessarily the end of the world passage. So, this is about the end of the world, but it's the aftermath of the end of the world. The day of the Lord precedes this physical coming with the clouds down to the earth. Once again, with the rapture before the tribulation, there is no mention of any signs or prerequisites of events going on which this person probably wouldn't take as literal anyway. So if everything can be reduced to, the day of the Lord can be reduced to simply spiritualizing that nothing real will happen, whether it's physical or spiritual, something happens in any analogy. So the fact is that there will be a real physical coming of the Lord. It says so right here. In no uncertain terms, you can't take it out of its context and suddenly put it into um, any kind of hyperbole or poetic expression. Even if you did, you would still come up with the fact that Jesus will literally return. This is not saying you will be saved. That's not what this is talking about. This is not a, a salvation passage. This is a prophecy of when Jesus will return and how. The when is more spelled out in other passages, especially Daniel and Revelation give us the when. So we know that this Acts 1, 9 to 11 is telling us in no uncertain terms that Jesus will return in a way that our physical eyes can see. That's all the point I need to make about this. When you, talk, when you hear people say that 
um, because of hyperbole, we can turn this historical narrative into some spiritual good and evil thing. I mean, it, just tell them that this verse is historical narrative. That's all you need to do. And I have other um, writings about preterism, about prophecy, about the literal historical grammatical interpretation method, which is what a hermeneutic is. Um, you can, if you wanted to learn about preterism, you would go to a preterism site. But when somebody offers this argument to me to say that Acts 1, 9 to 11 doesn't mean Jesus will physically return, I honestly don't think that they've thought this through. And uh, thanks for listening.